But don't you have when you said you were an athlete, so doesn't it give you an optimistic guy that, that still just works, you know? Well, um, I, you know, I'll tell you, I saw, exa I saw examples where it looked like there, were, there was a, a lot of positive things happening. We went to many schools where I can honestly say I felt like, geez, these kids are really learning something. And it, it's true. The, the teachers are very uh, enthusiastic and they're providing the right kinds of role models, I think. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I saw, sort of, I, I saw examples where I wasn't as convinced that maybe that was happening. And in terms of in terms of world peace, I mean, I think that's a, a grand ideal, and I think that you know the the, um, the the people that I was with were definitely interested in that, and they were working in that direction, and that's a positive sign, and that's certainly encouraging. On the other hand, uh, maybe it's just that I'm somewhat of a pessimist, mm -hmm. but I think that it, world peace is going to be take a lot more than that. So. Um. Would you plan to go to Turkey again? Or oh, I'd love to go to Turkey again. You bet. It was, it was a, a wonderful trip. I mean, we spent six hours in Ephesus, and I could have spent six days there, for example. Mm. I mean, yes. I, yeah, I really, I really did enjoy Turkey, and I would, I would love to go there again. I don't think that I would go again with the, the um, Institute for Interfaith Dialogue, however. I, I, you know, I'd like to go and get in a car. Excuse me. Oops. Get in a car and drive around, and mm -hmm. and you know do my own sightseeing and, and go to different places as well. Not to not to say anything bad about the trip, but just I think it would be uh, yeah. I'd like to go and tour myself. And advise your friends to go. You bet. I would advise uh, I would advise anyone to go to Turkey. Mm -hmm. You bet. Uh, okay. So let's talk about Dylan. Have you heard about Dylan before, or have you read about? Well, I have not. Uh, I, I had not read any of his material prior to the trip. However, I did read a couple of his books uh, while on the trip and after. I read um, Towards a Lost Paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, I read the book on uh, Islamic terrorism, and I read the book. Uh, well, I read the, the introduction, his introduction to Safik Khan's book on Rumi. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have some sense of, of Gulen's point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you had any information about the education activities initiated by him? Well, only what I experienced while I was there. I mean, I haven't read anything specifically on what he, uh, what he himself has done. I talked to Mohammed Cretan, and he sort of explained, you know, how Glenn started. And, you know, that was just a conversation mm -hmm. we had, and then obviously went to many of the schools. And uh, like I said, I was quite impressed with several of the schools. Others. Mm -hmm. There were questions raised in my mind, but uh, in general, that's my experience of, of the you know, his his educational uh, background or mm -hmm. his educational movement. What do you think about him? Educational activities all over the world uh, initiated by Dylan can contribute to bringing peace in the world. Well, I think yeah, I think education is critical. To, in the idea of developing peaceful solutions, and I think, I think not just education in the sense of uh, learning facts, but mm -hmm. in education in the sense of developing a capacity for critical self-reflection. People calling in to question their own preconceptions, their own mm -hmm. prejudices, and even their own beliefs. I mean, questioning my own religious faith and saying, "Okay, it, it, am I justified in?" accepting these beliefs that my parents have given me or that my culture has given me. Mm -hmm. Calling those things into question, I think that's what education is. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's Gulen's aim. Uh, from what I've read, I don't think that that is the, the sort of self-reflective kind of education that I'm describing is mm -hmm. the, the aim of the Gulen movement. So um, I, I think, yes, it's important. I think as people become educated, they become more self-aware, and even if it's not perfect, they gain that capacity. Uh, they gain, but I, I think what's really critical is this idea of s critical self-reflection, being able to, to call into question these basic paradigms of understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a limit to that. I, I think, you know, that, um, it, well, 
let me say, I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent about that. I was very impressed. One of the, one of the places that we went, there were, you know, there, Freud uh, and uh, Bertrand Russell, who is a mm -hmm. uh, famous uh, British philosopher, were both on the shelves in the library. So that, that was a point where I could say, hey, uh, there's, there's an open-mindedness, at least in the books that they select in the library here. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I'll that. tell you. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think, on some level, that there is. Well, it's important. Yeah. Well, let me let me back up first. I think the reason that there's conflict among religions is because a religion, most often, is a view about ultimate reality. It's a view about what absolute truth is, and those different religions have different views of what absolute truth are. Now, it's true that there are, are, are similarities between the Abrahamic religions, right? There are certain shared components. Mm -hmm. But when it comes right down to brass tacks, uh, the Christian isn't going to change his view about what that is, that absolute truth is. And the, the average Muslim is not going to change their view. And so, that, I think, is the conflict. The more literally you take that view of absolute reality, the more firmly you, you hold on to that, and the more you insist that you know what God thinks, as opposed to someone else in another religious faith or another uh, sort of with another kind of background, the, the, less, uh, the, the more likely there is to be conflict, and the more likely that conflict is to become um, you know, violent. Having said that, I think what's important in terms of dialogue is a dialogue where we can set aside our faith traditions. We can set aside our views of absolute truth and realize that, guess what? He doesn't believe the same way that I do. I don't believe the same way that he does. But I have to live with that person. And I have to, we have to enact laws. We have to enact, uh, you know, we have to have governments that protect their rights as well as ours. And, and we have to find a way to live, live in harmony. And I, I, I don't think that necessarily, well, I don't think necessarily the way to do that is simply through interfaith dialogue because it, 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 it seems to sort of eliminate those people who don't mm -hmm. have faith. And um, so that's a, that's a concern of mine. I think, yeah, I think dialogue is the way to go. In fact, uh, I'm actually writing a paper right now uh, for the the conference that you guys are going to have it uh, in Rice mm -hmm. uh, on this precise issue uh, mm -hmm. on the sort of what are the limits of dialogue, where do we draw the line, and how ought we or ought we not to 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 characterize dialogue? And it's it's essentially a response to one of my colleagues, uh, Darian DeBolt, who also went on the trip, not this last trip, but a trip an earlier trip had written a paper comparing a philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Gulen. And I'm going to sort of address his paper. And he's so. comparing Habermas and Gulen? Yeah, he's, playing, he's comparing Habermas and Gulen. And I think, I, I don't think he's quite right in the way that he's drawn the comparison. Mm -hmm. so. okay, okay. Well, I'll tell you, my view of 9-11, really, I, Here's the thing. I think that religion, throughout the, throughout the history of humankind, religion has been used to justify very, very terrible things. Mm -hmm. And in this, this is just an, another example where uh, religion has been used as sort of a cover for something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I think maybe the, the, the people who, did, who committed 9-11 were perhaps religious zealots. And had these sort of commitments to their view of absolute truth, and that is what motivated them individually. However, I think that that is, I, I, when I look at 9 11, I think 9 11 is a direct result of American foreign policy. I believe that America has, well, essentially, America has conducted a proxy, did conduct a proxy war with the Soviet Union for three decades. And that spawned a lot of awful, awful things. Mm -hmm. um, one book I would recommend to anybody who's interested in this subject is a, is a book called Good Muslim, Bad Muslim by Mahmoud Mandani. And basically, he just looks at the, the rise of political Islam and some of the sort of radical Egyptian scholars that, mm -hmm. whose ideas then filtered through madrasas and 
justified, you know, sort of developed a brand of Islam that justifies that kind of attack. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that when I look at 9 11, um, and I suppose I'm way out of the mainstream of most Americans, but it surprises me that something like that didn't happen.